It started for me when I was 15. I haven't always been in the church, but I did start at a, at a young age. I was saved at 11. And uh, I've been in the church before that, but the church wasn't in me. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Come on, somebody. So the, I was in the church, but the church wasn't in me. And I got saved at 11. And about the age of 15, I was singing in this church choir and I turned a song into a duet. Me and my friend, we turned it into a duet that the church, was, that the church choir was singing. And so the, the adults loved it. And yeah. And, um, and so we would sing it sometimes, sing it in the basement. One day, driving home from choir rehearsal, and my mom says to me, Khalid, sing that song. So, like, like Mary tells Jesus what to do. Right. Jesus says, not my time, woman. <laughs> says, yes, it is. You better, you better sing that song. So I sang the song. And uh, 15, no experience with the Holy Spirit. I start singing the song and I get through maybe two lines of it. And that's all I can get through because the presence of God floods the car like I've never experienced before in my life. And uh, it it was like a big rush of water just came into, came in through the windshield. Um, And I'm bracing myself with uh, this arm on the wind, on the, on the window and on the armrest. And I'm trying to get through the song, can't get through the song. I'm crying. I feel this presence. It's surreal. It's it's joyful. It's I'm crying, but I'm happy. And I'm just like, what is going on? I can't sing the song. I'm trying to get through it. And my mother, with all the wisdom in the world, she reaches over and she grabs my hand and she says, son, that's the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, I know that I was branded like a cow is branded to show the ownership of who this cow belongs to. I just felt like my heart, my life was branded and I was ruined for anything other than that. Um, I, I know that that experience is the foundation, it was the experience that allowed me to say no to a lot of things and yes to a lot of the things of God. It kept me from drug abuse, kept me. Like the the Lord is, he says he can keep you. He can pick you up when you fall, but he also says he can keep you from falling. Amen? Amen. And the Lord, in that experience, he branded me to the point that um, I was ruined for anything else, ruined for anything less than that within the realm of music and worship and the the, the kingdom of God. I was never a frozen chosen. I was never, uh, you know, my my church growing up, I was, it's a Baptist church, but it acts more Pentecostal. So I say Bapticostal. Bapticostal church, full of uh, spiritual stuff. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. And that thing stayed with me through college. It continued in college, different times. I, I would feel the Holy Spirit hover over me as I'm walking to class, singing a song um, called Hallelujah that a friend of mine wrote. And I would just feel his presence up above me and a little bit behind following following me to class, um, singing in the choir at, in, in, in college, uh, being weighed down by the presence, the kabod, the presence of the Holy Spirit. All of that, I find its roots in that first experience. And that first experience changed my life. That first experience caused me to go to college and be... Uh, challenged in my faith. I remember this one time uh, I was walking up to this corner and this guy, you know, all the, all the wise guys in, in college, they want to tell you 
this, that, and the other thing. They know the, the, all, the, all the wisdom, and they know all the, all the wonderful things. And they challenge you about your relationship with God, and you only know God. You only do this because this is what you've been taught to do, and all this other thing. You have to blah, 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 blah. blah. And in my heart, I said, I have experience with God. I know him. I felt his presence. You can say what you want. You can try to talk me out of, people can talk you out of religion. They cannot talk you out of relationship. If your religion is just religion and it doesn't get to the point where there's communication and intimacy with Jesus, then you'll be talked out of it. Your kids will be talked out of it. You guys will be talked out of it. You have to experience the presence of God. And for me, that came in worship. That came in that one moment when my mom said, sing, and I sang. And that blossomed into a bunch of different experiences like that. One time I was uh, with my girlfriend at the time. Um, She was a freshman at Wesleyan College. And I was a senior in my high school, and um, yeah, she was robbing the cradle. Yeah. <laughs> well, can you blame her? Yeah. I'm, just I'm, just I'm just playing. Yeah. I'm just joking. Um, take, edit that out. Um, <laughs> um, so she invited me up to like this little party she was having, and uh, there were people in the room. I was sitting on her bed about an inch away from the wall. And at this point, there were people just walking through, eating food, doing whatever they do. Someone took a videotape from VH1. You guys remember VH1? Okay. It was like the rival of MTV or whatever it was. Someone took a videotape and popped it in to the VCR. And then this music video pops up. And I'm sitting an inch away from the wall on her bed. As soon as the music starts, I'm thrown backwards against the wall, shocked out of this world, shocked. And, uh, and I'm looking around and I'm wondering what is happening? Like what, what is going on with me? Nobody else is responding. Nobody else is, is, is being jarred. And then they're just going about their normal life. And then the, the Lord showed me this light bulb. And then he said to me, boom, said to me, this is why the parents in your church don't want their kids listening to secular music. This, this is what it does to you. This is the effect it has on you. I was allowed to feel that because I spent three months going to choir rehearsal, singing gospel music in choir, back from choir, to football practice, away from football practice, to school, away from school. I had a CD player that um, I programmed in the songs. Remember, you can program in songs. So at night, I would put in uh, Fred Hammond's first choir album. (laughs) <laughs> yes, Fred Hammond and RFC, Radical for Christ, that's their name. Right? Go on Amazon and get it for your kids, get it for yourself. Um, I would program in the slow songs and I would listen to that at night. And it would just wash over me at night. Feel me at night. And that was for three months. That's how I lived my life. Nothing but, but the word through music coming in. Then I had that experience. There was another object lesson. I stopped eating McDonald's for three months. I didn't do this on purpose. It just happened. I stopped eating McDonald's for three months. I went back and I had a Big Mac. And my stomach was very upset with me. I said, okay. I think that was the last Big Mac I've ever had. This was when I was 18. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was the last one I had. I've had a lot of fish sandwiches since then, but that's a different story. I love the filet fish, and can't nobody stop me from eating it. So I love that. And Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is good. 
That's, that's, the, Lord's, that's the Lord's sandwich right there. Um, I love those things. <laughs> but I haven't had a Big Mac since. It made me sick. It affected me. Just like that secular music on that VH1 tape affected me. Music is a vehicle for things. It can be the things of God or it can be the things of the enemy. The choice about what goes in is yours. Your eye gate, your ear gate, all of those things are things that you need to guard because it affects your heart. From your heart, guard your heart, for from it flow all the issues of life. Out of the abundance of your mouth, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And so your life is affected because of what you say, and what you say is affected because of what's in your heart, and what is in your heart comes from what you hear and what you see. The whole process. What you hear and what you see. And so when worship is going on, when the Spirit of God is in you, filling you to worship the Lord, to encounter Him, you are being changed. It says, behold Him. The more you behold Him, the more you become like Him. How many want to be like God? The more you worship him and behold him in worship, the more you become like him. Not fully, not yet, little by little, step by step, the more you become like him. You want to become more prophetic? More prophetic? Worship, intimacy, stay in the presence, be a priest. Be a priest of the king. It's not about being prophetic. Paul says be prophetic. It's very important. But the more important thing than even prophecy is connection with the Holy Spirit. Connection with Jesus. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Because that enables you to encounter him. And in the place of encounter. In the place of prayer, that's when he speaks to you. And you turn that thing into prayer. You turn that thing into something that you might say to somebody. So there's a great, there's a great desire to want to prophesy. I love the prophetic. But the prophetic comes from intimacy. It comes from the place of worship and prayer. That's the fuel for it. Right? So there's this, there's this uh, 42-day fast that Pihop went on. And uh, we fasted for ministry. So we stopped prophesying to people, stopped ministering to people. And, uh, and the Lord told Cheryl that we were to go on this 42-day fast. And initially I said, yes, all right. Get these people out of my face. Don't have to pray for them. <laughs> no, I'm playing. I'm playing. I was like, yes, good, fast, pray, seek the Lord, 42 days. All right. But then I thought, wait a minute. If I don't do the well for 42 days, am I going to get rusty? And I didn't want to get rusty. I wanted to continue to flow in the prophecy, in the prophetic gift. And then I thought immediately, almost immediately after that, how are you going to hang out with the most prophetic man to ever walk the earth more and then become less prophetic? Not possible. You can't do it. You can't hang out with Jesus more and become less prophetic. Why? Because the spirit of prophecy is come on. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Can't hang out with him more and become less prophetic. It's such a powerful gift. I don't know why I'm on the prophetic mostly, but um, I'm supposed to be talking about worship, but here we go. Uh, the prophetic is powerful, so much so that, watch this, it, oh, I know why, okay, it is supposed to, it's intended to fuel the worship movement. How do I, how do I know? 
when John is listening to the angel prophesy, what is John the apostle, the mature apostle, was hanging out with Jesus for three years on the island of Patmos in the spirit, gets the revelation of, of, of God. The book of the revelation, we, the book of revelation we owe to him, right? Mature apostle. Mm -hmm. And when the angel comes to him and prophesies, what does he do? He worships the angel. That's how powerful this gift is. A mature apostle worships an angel. A mature, in the spirit, in the spirit, walked with Jesus, hung out on his breast. Lord, who's, who's doing the thing against you? It's Judas. Okay, Judas. Peter was afraid to even ask. But the mature apostle was like on his breast. Who's doing it? Jesus. Who's doing it? It's, it's going to be Judas. Okay, he gets the secret information because he's intimate with him. Yeah. That one worships an angel. Right. Idolatry for a second, hot second. And the, <laughs> and, and, the, and the angel says, what does the angel say? Yeah. Don't do that. Get up off me. Right. You ain't going to get me in trouble. <laughs> You're about to get me struck by lightning. Get off of me. Angel says, don't do that. This is just the testimony of Jesus. I'm just like you. I'm just like you and all your brothers. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. The prophetic is meant to fuel up the prayer and worship movement. That was the whole point of it. And it's what caused John to worship the angel. Worship is the goal of it. Worship is the beginning of it. It's the end of it. It's all in between. And it's the only thing that's going to last. That in prayer. The prophetic's going to end. Evangelism's is going to end. Passing out food, as good as it is, it's going to end. You can pass me food if you want to, as long as it's Chick-fil-A. But that's going to end. All of it's going to end. All of the things that we do, that we call the work of the ministry, it's going to end. The only two that last, worship and prayer. That's how important worship is. Um, and I, I do have some scripture. I know people want to hear scripture, so I have some scripture for you. I got it for you. Come on. All right, let me show you how powerful, another way how powerful worship is. All right, I'm going to try to get this right. Um, Second Chronicles, chapter 20. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, uh, verse 20. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20. This is my favorite, one of my favorite passages Concerning the worship movement. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, O Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the, to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. And when, he had begun to sing, when they had begun to sing praises, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, uh, Moab, and Mount Seir and had come against, who had come against Judah and they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose, against, rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished, the inhabitants of Seir helped, they, they helped to destroy one another. Then 
When Judah came to look out of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground and no one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things which they took for themselves, more than they could carry, more than they could carry. The victory is in worship. The victory is in your praise. There is Old Testament physical types and shadows, New Testament spiritual truth. So this is a type and shadow of victory that comes to you because of worshiping the one who can actually do what you need done. You have so many plans and so many ideas and so many things that you want to accomplish. And we leave it up to ourselves. We don't worship God. We don't pray about it. We don't seek the Lord about it. We need to understand that the victory is in prayer. The church that sings is the church that grows wings. And when you grow wings, you're in the presence. And when you're in the presence, everything that you need is there. Everything that needs to be accomplished is there. God does it. God does the work. And so what we need to understand is that he's already given those of us who are in Judah, who are Judah, the victory. When he told, um, uh, when Moses passed, and now Joshua was the leader, the young ones are the leaders, right? Joshua's leading. What does he tell Joshua when Joshua asks the Lord? Joshua asks the Lord, who do we send first up against this army that's coming against us? It's another army, another battle, another victory. Who do we send? He says, send Judah first because I've already given him the victory. He's already won. There's no armor on. There's no sword in the hand. The the army hasn't proceeded yet. I've already given him the victory. Why? What does it mean? It means that those who worship and pray, that is the place of victory. That is the place where you will be established in the territory that God wants to establish you in. That is the victorious place. That is the place where you will soar and succeed. And there is a word about revival coming. There is many, many words. There are many, many words about revival coming. I've had dreams. There's a word um, about a tidal wave coming. And I believe that the tidal wave will come, but the tidal wave will only affect in the long term those who dig into the presence of God and prepare their own hearts, prepare their own communities by digging into the place of prayer and worship and establishing something that God can fill. If you have something God can fill, he will fill it if you're pursuing him. If you don't have, if, if, if it's hard, fallow ground, there's no filling of that. Mm-hmm. But when you dig into it in preparation for it, when the tidal wave comes and it recedes, there will be a pool for you, a lake, an ocean, depending on how much you dig, how far you go. Okay. How much do you want? How, there is this, uh, this prophet that, I, that I've heard um, of before. And he said, you have as much of God as you want. You have as much of God as you want. I think I'm saying that right. In other words, the level that you're at right now is not because of him. It's because of your hunger. Mm-hmm. Well, is it something that, you know, Khalid, how do I, how do, I'm not hungry. How do I change my hunger? I want to be hungry. I want more of the presence. How do I do that? But I don't, I don't have it. I can't just manufacture it. It's inauthentic. That's a lie. Because you hunger for the things that you continually go to. So you have to decide, I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to make a decision to read the Bible. And then I'll start to hunger for the Bible. My heart catches up. I'm going to make a decision to be in the presence and to worship. Mm -hmm. Then I start to get hungry for it. 
I'm going to make a decision to go at six o'clock into the place of prayer. And then I start to enjoy it like I've never done before. Let me tell you this story and then I'll go. I'm, I'm, my time is cut short. I'll just one last story. Okay. So um, I went to the Philippines on a mission trip and came back and I felt like the Lord was saying that because of what happened on the trip, uh, that my wife and I, we were like to be together. We were to be like a team, a unit. It's like, wow, this would be awesome doing that kind of stuff regularly on the mission field, doing stuff like that. Because I would prophesy to somebody and then she would come over from the other side of the church. She would come over and prophesy the same thing. It happened multiple times. I was like, what is happening? I was like, I just said that, but in different words, but I said the same thing. And so I would tell, we would debrief on the way home. And so then, um, so then I felt like, yes, to go forward in, in marriage. And so uh, I pursued the Lord and I knew that uh, to get her hand in marriage, I was going to have to ask the fa- her father for her hand. But I felt, you know, her real father is, 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 is God the father. So I should do something to pursue him for her hand. So I said, all right, I want fast. How many like fasting? How many like fasting? Nobody likes fasting? You like fasting? Amen, I didn't know that. (laughs) You like fasting too. Uh... I don't like fasting. I like what fasting does. Um, I kind of like fasting. So I decided to fast. Fasted, and then the Lord, at the end of it, said, you and Lauren, 6 a.m., worship and pray. I began to do that. I said, yes. And it was, um, I was laying on the floor, and I was reading Song of Solomon, and uh, from that book, he said, he, his, I was laying on the floor and it was like his face, I couldn't see it, but it appeared right there. It was like the heat of his gaze was right here. And he was saying to me, 6 a.m., you and Lauren, worship and pray. I said, all right, did it. 6 a.m. to 7. And then at 6 a.m. to 7 turned into 6 a.m. to 8. And we would do it uh, Monday through Friday. And then it turned into Monday through Friday plus some other days. And then people started coming. And then uh, one person came and said, wow, this is like the anointing here is same as the anointing in Kansas City. And that really touched me because it's just the spirit. It's just the presence of God. And so one day, probably like three, four or five months into it, uh, I was tired. Takes a lot out of you. You got to wake up early in the morning. God, I think God loves like when you sacrifice your sleep. Early in the morning or late at night, sacrifice your sleep for him, he shows up. So I was was late at night and I was tired. I said, Lauren, I'm not going to go tomorrow. Tired. Not going to do it. Not doing it. I got up, went to a different room, and I looked down on the floor, and there were three hairs on the floor two perfect circles, and then one half circle. And from the angle that I looked at it at, it was a frown face. Immediately after I said, I'm not going. And I looked at this frown face, and I immediately felt, heard the Lord. It, It sounds weird, but this is what happened. The voice of the Lord came in through my side, and then reverberated out through my being. And he said, I'm going to miss you. And I love the presence of God, but I didn't know that he loved my presence. And so when I said, I'm not going tomorrow, he heard that. And he could have said, 
be a man of responsibility. There's people waiting at the door for you. You have to open the door. Be responsible. You have, you have to open the door. You know, be, be accountable. Do, he could have said all of those things and he would have been right. But he wooed me back to his house through the sweetness of his voice. Because I had been in his house for months, my hearing was attuned more to his heart and to the way that he speaks, the emotion with which he speaks. And he said, I'm going to miss you. He's calling you into the place of worship and prayer. He's calling you into the place of setting aside some things, fasting maybe, setting aside some things to pursue worship in a way that will train, will, will, will train you and change your life. Will change you and train you and prepare you for what's coming next. Because there is a wave. There is a wave coming. And if you can ride that wave, right now is dependent upon you. Right now is the time to take the time to take time by the hand and be like those ten virgins, the five that prepared and the five that didn't be like the five that did. Right now is the time to dig into the things of God, the kingdom of God, and prepare your hearts for what he's doing next. Because the wave's going to come and then it's going to recede. But what's going to be left is going to be in your heart. It's going to be in this church. It's going to be in this region if you dig deep right now into the place of worship and prayer. If you do the things right now that prepare you for tomorrow, you're going to be riding that wave. And just like I told the, the first service, just like there's uh, non-Jewish people, us, who are causing the Jewish people to come because of the jealousy. What do you call it? Provoking. Provoking them to come, the scripture says. You can either be the people of the presence or the people that are being provoked yeah. to the presence. Right. I'd rather be on the first end. I want to ride that wave. Amen. That's why we're building, birthing a house of prayer in San Diego. That's why we're digging deep into the presence of God in San Diego. I want you to really experience the heights of worship. To the church without mixture, I'll pour out my spirit without measure. And to the church that sings and doesn't allow Landon to stand up here and sing for you. Come on, somebody. Landon, tell them about it. <laughs> you allow Landon to stand up here and sing for you, you get nothing out of it. Singing changes your mental capacity, your spiritual capacity. It, rewi it literally rewires nerve endings in your brain. God made this for you. He doesn't need this. He wants it but it helps you. You sing and the presence encounters you. Landon sings, the presence is up here. Encounter him for yourself. He can't pull you in there. You know how frustrating it is to be in front of a congregation that doesn't worship as a worship leader? Let me tell you, I don't like it. I want to get down and smack some people sometimes in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? Smack you in Jesus' name. Wake up! Do you know who he is? He is the exalted one. The ancient of days. The I am that I am. 
Isaiah saw him as the one high and lifted up. The one who is worthy of worship. That's who we're coming to celebrate every Sunday morning. And prayerfully, you'll get into a rhythm where it's every morning. Every morning. Worship and prayer. Every morning encounter the presence of God. Amen. That's it. I'm done.